Hi, everyone. Uh, as you know, today we invited a fantastic artist scholar, Dr. Steffi McKnight. Dr. McKnight is an assistant professor at the MPD, and you'll meet her for the rest of the years while studying at Carleton. Uh, she will introduce her approach to storytelling specifically related to research creation, culture studies, and fine arts. Let's welcome Dr. Steffi McKnight. And hi, Dr. McKnight. Thank you so much for your time. We are very honored to invite you as a guest lecturer. I'm sure students know about you, but could you introduce yourself briefly with your words? Excellent. Uh, thank you, Sojang, for inviting me. And uh, this is really exciting because I taught intro to storytelling last term or last year. Uh, so this is fun to be here in a different capacity. My name as was introduced is Steffi. Uh, you can call me and refer to me as Steffi. Uh, I am an assistant professor at Carleton, but I am actually currently based in Cataraqui, Kingston, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee. I'm a white settler queer femme of center who uh, works as an artist scholar in both a professional and a personal context. So in my scholarly work, I use research creation as a methodology for knowledge production, but then in more independently, I also do art for my, my own personal needs and desires. So you'll kind of see the aspect of me more professionally in a research context today. But if you wanna talk about art in a less academic context, we can also do that as well outside of this presentation. So today we're going to talk about research creation and arts-based research methodologies in the context of fact-based storytelling. And the reason why we're doing this and the importance of that is because we acknowledge there are different ways in which we can tell stories. A lot of the ways in which we are learn to tell stories or that we are engaging with in this course are very much Western perspectives of storytelling. And when we break down traditional modes of Western storytelling, we can start bringing in other aspects uh, from BIPOC, queer, marginalized people and the ways in which we may tell stories in ways uh, that are culturally, socially, and politically activated. So in terms of research creation, and arts-based research methodologies, it's one of the most recent non-traditional methodologies for storytelling in an academic context and can often be merged and used in uh, research, or sorry, community-based research, as well as using a two-eyed seeing approach. And we could talk about a two-eyed seeing approach later in this presentation, but just for the context of where I'm speaking at today, a two-eyed seeing approach is the juxtaposition of Western knowledges with uh, Indigenous knowledges. So acknowledging that we have different ways of telling stories, different ways of sharing facts, and that research creation can become an anchor to talk about these stories in a uh, less linear fashion that you perhaps may be used to in either in a text or a book or um, even something as simple as, as film where we're engaging with it, but research creation allows us to do something a little bit different with that. So I introduced myself briefly, um, but again, I'm gonna emphasize that you can call me Steffi. My pronouns are she, they. And if you have any questions, you can email it me at steffi.mcknight at carlton.ca, or you can check out my artist website, which is smm or smcknight.com. So today we're gonna to talk about very briefly, what is research creation, the theorization, the definition, uh, and then why it's important in storytelling and research methodologies. I've alluded a little bit to that in my introduction, but uh, really getting at the crux of why it's important that you consider this in the next four years and my research and how I implement creative interventions. I also want to premise today with knowing that although you're meeting me today in first year, I'm probably going to be one of the last faculty members that you work with in your program because I am teaching third year and fourth year. So at the point where you're going to start working with these technologies and software in the next two years. So it'll be really important that once you get to me as a faculty, that uh, you have the skills and you're thinking about research creation, because I am going to emphasize that, especially in your capstone projects, as, as a method of engaging with organizations and to think about your audiences and who you're working with, as well as what technologies you are going to use to convey those stories. So it's a really good to introduce me today so that you have this framework, because in the next three years, when you're actually working with me again, hopefully this is not going to be the first time you hear research creation. 
So research creation, uh, it's really important to acknowledge that that is a Canadian concept, a North American concept. Here's a map. Uh, there's a quite a big umbrella term creative research that floats around I would say probably the most consistently across the world, but research creation is very much generated in North America and it is fairly new. The first grant for research creation was awarded by SHRC in 2004. So we're kind of just marking the first like 16, 15 years of, of something so important. However, it has roots uh, in practice-based research in Australia uh, and in artistic research in Germany. So I'm showing a map here of these different forms of creative research. So you see uh, artistic research here about an around Germany, we have practice led research, which is based in the UK, and then practice based research in Korea, which is really what So Zhang has been doing as well as in Australia. So we see that re creative research is actually a geopolitical uh, methodology that changes with the needs of the cultural, social and political aspects of each uh, academic institution in which invites it. So we could use research creation interchangeably. However, I don't advise that because depending on the location of which this creative or different creative researches are integrated, it does change uh, the funding models. It changes what the research expectations are, what, pri what priorities are examined by these certain methodologies. So when I say research creation, I do wanna emphasize that we're talking about a North American context and that I'm not gonna use it interchangeably for artistic research, practice-led research and practice-based research because those methodologies have been established in a way that are quite different than research creation. And I'll explain the difference as we move forward. So there are a few Canadian scholars who define research creation as a form of learning and knowing through making. And this is really important that we're not talking about translations of knowledge. When we talk about research creation, we think about knowledge building through the experimentation forms. So if you are in a lab and you are to creating an experiment, often what is important in the lab is the aspects of the from point A and point B of the hypothesis and not necessarily the finding, it's how you found the finding. In research creation, it's very similar in the sense that as we're creating either a sculpture, a media project, an animation project, that the knowledge comes from the practice. So it's the, the in-between of the theory and the research creative output. And that's why we emphasize a lot with the term research creation, the hyphen, because the hyphen bridges the research and creation and allows us to think about the process of creation that is happening rather than just an art object as a translation of a theory. We see this a lot. This is really where the difference between MFAs come in is that when we do an MFA, a uh, Master of Fine Arts, we might have a research project. Uh, for instance, we might talk about climate change and artwork that is created in the context of climate change is usually an extension of the theory. So either a translation of the theory or a way of visualizing the theory. However, in research creation, the knowledge and research and theory is created while you are creating that object and that object doesn't necessarily need to completely work in order for the research to work. So you don't always have to have a cool artwork in the end because you're thinking and prioritizing about the process. So in terms of research creation, one of the problems in a North American context is because it's so new, we are constantly trying to explain its importance. And it's really important that we emphasize that it is a form of research in its own right, that art can be research in its own right. And that it's not only about art making, again, I wanna emphasize it's about the process. But that research for creation was what we'll often hear as well, is usually about the gathering of materials, practices, technologies, collaborators, narratives. So it's really important that we acknowledge that research creation, again, is not created in a vacuum, that it also includes collaboration and talking about uh, technologies and things that may seem a little bit mundane because you might think, well, my output is more important. But again, for us, it's not necessarily the output. It's about the doing. 
And again, I just want to, I mean, I feel like I'm going to repeat this often, but I do want to emphasize that it's not about elevating an object or about replicating a theory or elevating that theory, but of taking that theory and coming up with new findings through the practice and through the research of the making of the work. So what I've already kind of explained uh, is when we're talking about research creation, we want to emphasize the hyphen. And what the hyphen does is it induces spaces for failure, thought creation, and exploration. And this means that in research creation, if you create an object and it completely fails, that's OK, because the process of creating is actually where the knowledge is generated. So if you create a painting and you have an idea of, of Again, I'm going to use the example of climate change and you're painting and you're coming up with these ideas and these colors and uh, you're creating some some concepts as you're thinking and as you're making that's actually more important than what the image looks like at the end. The only time the end product is really a huge priority is if you want to take it a step forward and you want audience engagement, but often research creation audience engagement will happen through the production phase and not necessarily in the exhibition phase. The exhibition phase is quite complicated because then it becomes subjective, then it becomes audiences can decide how they want to engage with it, whereas a lot of research creationists, what they'll do is they'll bring in the audience through the production phase for community-based engagement, and that, again, and will change the narrative of the artwork and then in itself may fail again. So it's like you often don't know where you're going to head when you're creating a research creation practice or project because you want to do all the collaborating and all of the, the thinking while making and then you can publish it and you can exhibit it how you want afterwards, but that is often not necessarily the most exciting piece. And when people do publish on research creation, again, they don't tend to publish about the end result, they tend to publish about the creative practice, the, the outline of the project, of how they got to that project, not necessarily the project itself. So why is research creation important? Well, I've already kind of alluded to that it breaks down Western knowledge traditions. Uh, it does this by introducing new methodologies in academia that are often considered uh, less innovative and less important. There are a few articles that explain how research creation has um, no value in academia because it can be subjective because it doesn't follow traditional means. And research creationists have for multiple years now explained that that is not the case and have proven that it's not the case. And we see, are seeing this with funding and such that research creation is getting more attention. It invites collaboration from scholars, art galleries, curators, artists, academics, communities, technologies. So one of the things that I will often say is that research creation invites collaboration between human and non-human or human and technology so that collaboration isn't only a human on human activity, but that it can happen uh, between objects. It can happen between human and land. And this is really where we start breaking down Western knowledge traditions and thinking about two eyed seeing approaches because a lot of indigenous artists don't necessarily always make art for other humans and may actually make art for land or make art that speaks to land or in collaboration with land. So research creation opens up collaboration that perhaps may seem to contradict traditional Western knowledges. It allows for diversifying storytelling and publishing outputs. So we're not only publishing in 2D models or in text or in writing, we can publish on web archives or up or uh, exhibitions or um, in any type of AI or VR type software, research creation has no boundaries on how to actually publish it. And this has become a problem because research scholars, research creation scholars are, are have limited areas right now to publish. So we're trying to catch up with this, but it's because it's so vast and there's so many possibilities uh, that we're trying to, to figure out how we can do this. And it adapts to shifting landscapes and culture and academia. And that's what's really, really important is that we're able to, to move with what's happening in the world because art is never static. Art, as we know, uh, changes with culture, with politics, with time and history. So research creation also does that because it is rooted in fine art methodologies. 
So what is really important uh, is that research creation, the way that I see it, focuses on three modalities. And uh, one of them is collaboration, as I emphasize. The second is social justice. And social justice comes from a lot of uh, contemporary research creationist scholars saying that research creation allows to talk about social justice, so climate change and the Anthropocene. So there's a lot of happening here um, that we're seeing research creation as able to talk about social political events in a way that perhaps, uh, I mean, art has always done this, but in a way that is more academic and more situated within a university context. And again, that it juxtaposes theory and practice. So although it's art-based, it's still rooted in theory and practice. It's still rooted in knowledge production and that can't be lost in research creation because then it just doesn't become research, it just becomes creation. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about my research creation in the context of what I just explained to you. Uh, I use creative research mainly because uh, I have a little bit of feelings about the definition of research creation right now that, that need to be, drawn out and need to be thought more. So I may use research creation and creative research interchangeably. And that's because creative research, as I mentioned at the beginning, is an umbrella term. I also want to go back to the beginning where I mentioned, so for the three modalities, social justice is really actually what separates research creation in Canada than other, uh, other creative research methodologies, because it is really what centered research creation, which uh, whereas, uh, so Zhang and I have, when we can talk about this after, have talked quite a bit about the difference between social justice in a Canadian context, uh, then perhaps it be a, a practice-based context when we look at those two definitions. So I have uh, an extensive creative research portfolio. I mostly do research creation. If I do projects on the side, they're um, quite small. So most of my larger known projects are research creation based, but I'm gonna talk about three. So the first I will talk about is uh, organic surveillance, which I completed in my master's. And then I will talk about Colder Now, which I completed in my PhD, and then Cam Hunters, which is an ongoing project collaboration with a colleague of mine, Dr. Julia Chan. So organic surveillance was created between 2014 and 2016. The goals of it was to reveal the ways in which rural, rural people in Northern Ontario use surveillance technologies to protect their property from uh, interlopers and trespassers, whether human or non-human. And this is a research area that is quite underdeveloped in surveillance studies. So this is not only one of the first artistic projects related to this. It's also one of the first ever theoretical renderings of this because for some reason surveillance studies likes to emphasize uh, surveillance as an urban practice. But essentially what this project did was theorize and prove that urban surveillance influences were creeping up into rural spaces despite the myth that we say, especially in a Canadian context, that surveillance and technology isn't in the rule and that we can escape surveillance and technology by going into quote nature. So when I went into quote nature to escape surveillance, I found that actually there was some really interesting forms of surveillance happening in those spaces, but for different reasons than perhaps in rural or in urban areas, pardon me. So one of the things that I did end up doing was creating a website. And this is something that you'll see if you follow my work. I tend to create websites for almost every project that I engage with in a research creation context. The reason for that is because of the collaboration and the community-based aspect of the work. So this community that I engaged with, which is in Northern Ontario, so you are currently in Ottawa, some of you. So if you think about it in the context of Ottawa, this is probably about six hours from you. The community is quite small and in it is very far, about an hour away from the largest urban center, which is Sudbury, which is also not a very big city in the context of Southern Ontario. But what we were seeing is that regardless of that, there was an influence of urban surveillance technologies filtering into rural spaces. So I created this website as an online archive and exhibition for my participants because 
because of the size of the actual community, they don't have galleries. They don't have access to art in the same ways as we do. They barely have access to internet. So the website was actually probably not the best idea either. But I really wanted to emphasize the importance of this project because in a way that was adaptable and changeable and was able to be shared with my participants because they offered so much knowledge to me. So what I mean by participants is I actually interviewed participants. I took photos on their properties. I had to get ethics approval. And uh, because of the art based and the creative research component, I was able to take photos that would have never been able to be taken if I didn't have ethics approval or an institution or trust from my community. So because I grew up in this community, it was quite easy for me to integrate and to talk about my ideas. But because of the nature of some of the photographs, and I'll show them, it wasn't actually something that anybody could kind of can just come in and do because there was, I had to be on private property. I had to have permission. I had to be able to share images. So essentially, all I have to say is the website is a way of giving back to the community, saying thank you for their, for their work, for helping me with this research, and also allowing them to see images that, uh, that they were part of. So I'm not going to talk too much about the project, but I did want to show uh, some documentation of an exhibition that I did have. So it was called Organic Surveillance Security Myth in the Rural. And as I mentioned, we were really trying to check, uh, see the ways in which people use surveillance in rural areas. But some of the most interesting documentation were the documentation of hunting cameras on properties. So hunting cameras were initially designed to watch animals. They are created with uh, infrared capabilities. They're not always on, they're battery operated, so they only, they're motion censored. They often, depending on the sophistication of these cameras, will have a different interface. So either they'll be camouflaged, they'll have texture so that you can't see them in space. Uh, when you upload, when you attach them to a tree or put them in a bush or something, they're, they're supposed to be quite hidden. And usually these are used they, mostly for recreation, recreational purposes to watch animals for fun or to trail them. They're called like, they can also be called trail cam cameras, uh, trail cams. And usually they're, they're meant to trail animals so that you have a sense of where they're going to be if you were gonna go hunting for them. So if you can set up a camera on a property and um, you could check the next morning if there was a, a moose or a deer that walked by and then you have a really great shot of them. But then you also know that that might be a space in which you can perch for the day and, and do hunting. However, what is happening in these communities is they have function creeped. They've taken these cameras and are no longer only using them for hunting or for recreational purposes, but are actually using them in place of a CCTV camera. So what we're seeing here are cameras that have been up uh, installed. I keep wanting to say uploaded. <laughs> They've been uh, installed for the purpose of protecting their property from trespassers. So the first one on the, the left uh, on the tree with the snow and the bark, and these can exist in the winter. So this is a, a community that gets quite snowy in the winter. Uh, this one was actually set up for a weekend because uh, the, the participants were going out of town and they wanted to ensure that nobody was, you know, coming in on their property while they were out of town. So it was actually pretty much directed straight to their house into the opening of their home. The, and that one is not up permanently, so it was okay to take a photo of it quite easily because they can just take it down, change the tree or whatever. But uh, it's important that I don't tell you who those participants are because then if you were to go to their place, then you may know that that camera is there. And, and that was the risk. That's the ethical risk. The second is actually one that's up all the time. And this is also on a property on the side of a home. And uh, the participant asked me if I could edit it or make it a little bit less less uh, obvious of where it would be because that is a camera that is attached to their home and it is something that they are using to protect their property because they have a lot of livestock and they don't want people to come in. But also uh, the sophistication of these cameras are interesting because the one on the left is battery operated. It kind of just takes stop motion. Whereas the one on the right has been connected to their television. So as they're in their home, they could check what's happening in their yard 
remotely uh, without actually having to go to the camera itself and taking out an SD card. So we're seeing here that the CCTV trend is still happening in the north in rural areas, but are taking the form of trail cams, hunting cams instead, because they're more accessible in terms of the price. They make sense because the people who are using them are most likely hunters and who are integrated in that type of practice. And uh, they're very easy to mount, take down, move around as needed. So that's pretty much everything for this project. I wanted to talk about it specifically in the context of collaboration uh, and also with community-based research and how research creation can do this and also talk about a very important social justice issue because we know that surveillance is something that uh, is very pervasive and damaging for a lot of marginalized folk. And I do want to talk about very, very briefly, and I, I don't have time to go into too much detail here, but what's really important if we took this project a step further in the context of property protection, we can also talk about this in the context of whiteness, of, of colonialism, of property, and of protecting property that has actually been stolen by uh, Indigenous people, so specifically in this location, the Anishinaabe and Atikiamakaching, so like this is like a, actually a space in which has been taken through a tr through a treaty and is now the the idea of privacy and control is not only being uh, maintained by quote the crown but also by the people who have now either bought settled on this land and are now trying to protect it from interlopers and and that's a really uh, interesting read of power and of colonialism that uh, we can go into more detail but for now it's pretty this is this was the scope of the project so the next project I want to talk about is Colder Now, uh, and this one was very much rooted in contemporary colonialism in Canada, specifically post 9-11. And what was really important about this project for me is that I, as a, a white settler, wanted to explore the ways in which surveillance post 9-11 would create systems of whiteness to further colonize Canadian citizens and just Canada in general, specifically Indigenous peoples and land and resources. So one of the ways that I wanted to explore this was through, again, research creation and art production, but I really wanted to focus on my identity. So rather than speaking on behalf of Indigenous peoples or BIPOC or queer people, I wanted to talk about me specifically as a white person and the ways in which I move through space in ways that are privileged because of, of my, my identity. So at the time of this project, that when I first started it, uh, this was shortly after 2015, which was the implementation of Bill C-51, uh, the anti-terror legislation in Canada. And that bill specifically uh, was a an adaption of a previous bill about anti-terrorism that came out right after 9-11. Now, the issue with Bill C-51 is that they really wanted to create a definition of terrorism. And when I say they wanted to create a definition of terrorism, what they really did is actually didn't <laughs> create a definition of terrorism. They started using, and when I say they, I mean the government and uh, Canadian, the Canadian institution. Um, instead of actually creating a definition of terrorism, they kind of backtracked and made it much more vague. And this was specifically done so that any form of dissent or anything that would quote, like threaten the Canadian idea would be considered, uh, would be considered terrorism and would be considered something that needed to be infiltrated by police or through legislation or through the law. And what we saw very quickly, a lot of scholars were very concerned about this bill, but more importantly, what we started to see was an increase of policing of and surveillance of Indigenous peoples in Canada, specifically around times of, uh, quote, Canada Day, uh, and some of the ways in which Indigenous peoples would protest uh, Canada Day. And also, uh, well, we've seen this a lot with the RCMP and um, 
activist for pipe for the pipelines uh, across all of either the US and in Canada. So there's not even just one example of a, a protest that I could talk about. It was fairly consistent across all of them. And also in terms of like any type of dissent or any type of demonstration of being not okay with what the government was doing, Indigenous people became the number one target and were actually called terrorists. Despite the fact that the, the actual bill said that artistic interventions, protests, and dissent wouldn't be considered uh, under Bill C-51 as a problem. However, then again, we saw examples of how this came up uh, when a group of Indigenous protesters put up a teepee on Canada or Parliament Hill in Ottawa during again I'm just supposed to say quote Canada Day or so-called Canada Day and where the RCMP and the police were called and they were arrested and charged because of this act of something very very simple um, as erecting or putting up a teepee on the Capitol's mountain or hill like Parliament Hill which is supposed to be at its core celebrating this, this event, but also obviously we acknowledge that it's an event of colonialism, that moment, despite how small and how non-dangerous putting up a TP was, was considered terrorism from, from Canadian, uh, from a Canadian perspective and a white perspective. So essentially what I wanted to do with this project was talk about, again, my perspective and my privilege, but also the institutions that are making these rules and the institutions that are upholding whiteness through these types of legislations. And one of the largest ones, and you will know of this one in Ottawa, is the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, which is also known as CSIS. So I created uh, several images, aerial images of CSIS trying to reveal what it's what it's going on with it and including this large neon called the Triangle of Trust, uh, which, as, which essentially was supposed to visualize aspects of, it's kind of like a play on visualization. It emphasizes that the that ceases is something that we can't touch, that we can't have access to despite its invasive power, but also trying to bring it into space to understand it. So there's um, a lot of things that are happening in this space or in this work specifically, but essentially the whole point of the exhibition was to reveal these types of invasive surveillance mechanisms that are upholding whiteness, upholding identities like mine uh, by creating an othered body, which are indigenous people and BIPOC people, indigenous people specifically, who are supposed to be the most prioritized, like whose land this is now, who are victims of these invasive, uh, dangerous, violent laws and naming them terrorists for protecting their land from colonialism. So it's, uh, it's an interesting duality that we could talk about contemporary clo colonialism specifically in the aspect of surveillance and policing uh, in this way. So the last project I want to talk about, and very briefly, is Cam Hunters. And the reason why I want to talk about this one in the context of research creation is because not only is it the one that is the most uh, ongoing in my life right now, and it's adapting to the changing framework for research creation, but it's also at its core a project on collaboration. And my, uh, and re <laughs> sorry, at its core, re Cam Hunters uh, is a co-performance duo between my colleague Julia Chan and I and uh, we started working on this in 2017 we both did our PhD at Queen's University and we came together because not only did we have an interest in surveillance and mutual interest but we also had very different ideas about surveillance we came from two very different spectrums of, of voyeurism studies and surveillance studies and Often when you hear surveillance studies, I think everybody kind of assumes it's this one, one type of discipline. But Julia is very much integrated in voyeurism and in uh, non-consensual watching, whereas I was really interested in, in the context of colonialism, in the context of policy and law and technology. And where we both kind of intersected was 
also surveillance in the context of whiteness. So we were very interested. We each had individual art practices and we were pretty much, we came across this idea as almost like a joke. We were just laughing one day talking about wouldn't it be cool if we could be like these cam hunters and find surveillance cameras and Airbnbs. And it ended up actually spiraling into this full performance over the last four years uh, that keeps developing. So initially we were looking at Airbnbs and uh, looking at surveillance cameras and surveillance detection me mechanisms that would be in Airbnbs. And with that, we developed to follow trends and surveillance since then. So we create videos, unboxing videos. I'll show you some, what our website looks like. So we have a website that markets almost as though we were actual cam hunters, but we have a couple videos that we've created uh, how to find cameras and Airbnbs. We also did unboxings. And essentially what we're doing is we're mimicking this DIY almost influencer culture where we are trying to make these very mundane things known, you know, that there's cameras in the places that you stay through very fun, high performative methods. So a lot of this is parody. A lot of it I wouldn't take uh, seriously in terms of the method, but the knowledge and the research is still very important and still dangerous and still important and still very relevant. So we have this very playful methodology, which research creation allows us to do. It allows us to collaborate. It allows us to be more creative, but at the same time, you could be having fun watching our videos and still know uh, how invasive surveillance can be in certain spaces. So we really uh, took that idea of playfulness and ran with it. So we created a podcast that has eight, season one has eight episodes so far where we talk about different surveillance themes and they are very random and they could be from anything. We've talked about reality television to cute animals to aliens and essentially, again, talking about the pervasiveness and the theory of surveillance and policing, but also through a context that uh, allows for some parody and playfulness. And what also ended up happening is we moved towards less from a creative standpoint and through COVID moved into more of a toolkit kind of aspect. So we created a statement on declining online imaging for people who want to use them in their classrooms or meetings. And then we also compiled a list of resources. So if you need resources on images, surveillance and consent, we have an archive of that as well as an archive on a bunch of articles of examples of cameras and Airbnbs. And what we are currently working on that is quite uh, quite interesting is a book project and a speaker series on surveillance and pleasure, which because at our root, the work that we do is pleasurable and it's about fun. We also wanted to talk about surveillance, the ways in which marginalized communities use surveillance pleasurably to speak back and to uh, use it as a form of empowering and turning the surveillance gaze on itself. So we've developed quite a bit in the last four years, uh, really much rooted in the ways in which research creation develops. But I think we've kind of found ourselves in this playful space of collaboration, of fun, but also of very theoretical importance. And now we are moving towards kind of putting that all together in this book project and as well in a speaker series that is based at Carleton right now. So we had uh, director Nicole Baswin and, and uh, Andrea Werhern come and speak about the context of surveillance and pleasure. So that, this one is quite all over the place in context of the other projects, but it is something very dear to my heart. It's something that is developing. And it really, at its core, shows how collaboration with humans, non-humans, technologies, and just the ways in which that works politically and culturally to fabricate these really important artifacts that can be used as tools or can be used as entertainment or pleasure. Uh, it's really up to you, the viewer, to engage with this how you see fit. 
So that's everything at the core for, for today uh, in the context of my work, as well as research creation. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know. I am very invested and passionate about research creation. I am currently also working on a project called ProtoHive, which is a center for innovative research creation in so-called Canada. So if you're interested in being involved with that or want to know more about research creation, you can find me at steffi.mcknight at carlton.ca, or you can email ProtoHive directly at ProtoHive at uh, ProtoHive at carlton.ca. It's very simple as well. So thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much, Sojong, for inviting me and having me speak here. And uh, I look forward to, to continuing this conversation with all of you. Thank you, Steffi. I was really fascinating talk and then I learned a lot. And it reminds me our conversations about the differences between research creation and practice-based research and how the creative artwork generate knowledge, all that. So you provide a lot of context and a lot of information, but because this is first year courses, so I'm, uh, um, I guess maybe students may not familiar with the concept of like fine arts sort of approach or culture studies, because even maybe in Canadian context, research creation more specifically related to fine art practice, but practice-based research, more general term, um, even the cinematic or other types of storytelling uh, can be also related to the research creation, I believe so. So could you uh, explain more about your approach, your approach to research creation more specifically related to your areas of expertise or academic background. And also if students uh, want to do research creation, not particularly related to sort of fine art or visual art practice, it can be different types of media practice, how they can incorporate at research creations to that. Great question. So I think it's really important, yes, what Sojang is saying about uh, emphasizing that research creation is rooted in the fine arts and what fine arts actually mean at face value uh, in, in an academic context and also in a granting context is anything that is uh, from sculpture to painting to printmaking, drawing. It's like the very much at the fundamentals of the traditional modes of art making often even excludes craft uh, and performance. So I don't technically view research creation or fine arts as, as limited as that, but in the, the grand scheme of those, that's often what happens. However, in the context of research creation, when we talk about fine arts, we often extend it to media production, we extend it to filmmaking, we extend it to performance, to sculpture, to installation. So it actually is more, is beyond fine arts. So I would actually read it as fine arts and media studies or media production. But I think a lot of research creationists will use fine arts interchangeably. In my own practice, uh, I focus specifically on performance and on installation. So I use a lot of found footage or found objects and try to create an immersive experience, not necessarily through AI, but allows objects and sculpture to become what people engage with. So for me, the research creation comes in not only in the aspects of uh, the final project, but the collecting of materials, the collaboration of putting those materials together and the conversations that are happening at the gallery afterwards as well. So for instance, Triangle of Trust, I didn't make that neon myself, but I was in constant conversations with a human who was building that neon and I sent drafts back and forth and the conversation and the production through the back and forth is really what made it uh, research creation. In terms of how you can integrate this, I think it's important that we acknowledge that pretty much what you're already doing at its core has some type of threat of research creation because you are taught by faculty who have practice-based research in mind. And what I think a lot of students that I've taught are very reluctant to, to care much about the research aspect or like the writing aspect or the exploration. Often we kind of just want to build something and make it and then that's it. But what I find really important is actually the thinking process and the development that happens as you're writing your drafts, as you're making outlines, as you're storyboarding. That is what makes your work unique 
uh, because a lot of people have done what you've done. I think the reality of being an artist is acknowledging that we're only so creative. Uh, but what is important is that the ways we do things are always going to be different than somebody else because we're always going to have our own little flavor to it. And with research creation, because we prioritize how we do things, that is really where it's it gets interesting. I want to know why you made those choices, how you made those choices, because in the end, that work will get done. But the ways in which you got there is going to be different. And finally, in the context of storytelling, research creation is really important in the context of storytelling, especially with fact-based storytelling, because again, it is rooted in research, it is rooted in knowing, it's rooted in truths, and it's rooted in ways of seeing things. So in the context of creative, if you're in like a fine arts background, you know, you might make an abstract an abstract painting, it's very different when you're doing research creation in the context of storytelling, because we are investigating an idea. We're just investigating it in a different way than perhaps writing a paper. So being aware of, uh, I think the research and truth is really important here. And it's the fact base that's really important. And that's what makes research creation so interesting and innovative is because you are searching for truth. You are searching for research and coming out with findings. You're just doing it in a different way. That's awesome. That's really insightful Thanks, answer. And I hope I answered all of your questions. Yeah, it, <laughs> is, it is. It's, it's very, you know, it was very, you picked the point. And I think this is related to questions uh, because uh, in these courses, we were having a lot of conversation, discussions about ethical approach mm -hmm. to the fact-based storytelling. Because even uh, I was a documentary filmmaker and I know I'm aware that uh, you uh, telling a story about marginalized people is not necessarily not, not necessarily good because uh, it can make them make their situation fragile. Also, there is a part, part dynamic between the subject and object, all that. So, but you are particularly empathized the uh, the concept of social justice and also you are critical, very critical about the notion of civilians, all that. So could you just advise the ethical approach to the fact-based storytelling in general? Yeah, that's excellent, Sojang. That's a great question. And for students who will have me moving forward, I will say this till I swear the day I die. Uh, there is nothing more important than positionality when telling a story and where you're coming from. So when you do take a class with me, one of the first things I'm gonna ask you to do is situate yourself in the context of the work you're doing so that we fall don't fall into this trap of us speaking on behalf of communities and doing research that you know, those communities may not want or doing it completely wrong or doing something that benefits us, the researcher, and not the community. And that happens all the time. And that's why we have ethics boards. And that's why we talk about ethics, because we want to ensure that the research we're doing is helpful and that it is benefiting the communities in mind. So what I do, and I spoke a little bit about this in the context of Colder Now, uh, instead of speaking about the marginalization and violence of policing on Indigenous people, because there are enough Indigenous people who are writing about this, there's enough BIPOC people who are writing about it, and I think their voices should be highlighted. I don't think they need another white person speaking about their problems um, in that context, because we need to give them space in which to talk about that. But for me, although I'm really invested in that and I care uh, in the context of social justice, what I do is I tend to talk about myself through a white perspective. So how I am rooted in systems of whiteness and how I am privileged. So I often talk about myself in the context of, 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 um, of my access to property. So again, that's what this falls into organic surveillance where I talk about my relationship to that community. I have a relationship there because my family has property that has been taken uh, and is a product of colonialism. So for me, I'd rather speak about myself and how I can change my perceptions of the world and how I can make a difference through a white perspective. And then I'm creating work for white people about whiteness. I'm speaking to white people in the hopes that white people will change rather than creating a document or creating a work of art that's just going to translate uh, indigenous knowledge. That's not, that's not my goal. My goal is to give space to people to speak. And then if I have something to say, then it has to be rooted in my identity. 
And I think that with what is most ethical is also going into communities who you know, uh, who you have a piece with. So for instance, organic surveillance, again, I lived there. I still live there. I have a, a camp there. I've been there for 30 years. So for me to come into that space and to talk to the, my family and the people I love, the people who knew me since elementary school and to have seen me grow up, that's really important. But also I have to acknowledge that I would have not have gotten the details and the access to property and access to technologies I did without that connection. I don't think that a lot of those people would have allowed anybody to come on their property and say, hey, yeah, take a picture of my surveillance cameras because they're here specifically to avoid you from coming here. So I was very fortunate in that. So in terms of ethical storytelling, the first thing I will always say is know who you are, know where you're from, know where, where your family's from in the context, be aware of your positionality in a social, political, cultural way and use that to tell stories. Don't let that stop you, but perhaps your audience and the way you're gonna tell stories may be different. That's brilliant because I think your answer is perfectly aligns our rest of assignment because our assignment is gonna be created the effect-based storytelling about their personal experience because I recommend them to start beginning from autobiography because it's always good start to explore myself and uh, to try to see the world or contextualize the world from our perspective. I think that is the very, very important. Yeah, so this is a perfect alignment and students will learn a lot from you uh, to do their assignment. And also I'm gonna explain more about auto-ethnographic sort of research aspect and that will be very related to what Steffi said it. So thank you so much also, for that. I was gonna say, it's just also so important to to speak about your positionality because it's also the thing you know the most. I feel like we are often trying to learn so much about different communities because we want to speak about those communities. And often it becomes so whitewashed, it becomes uh, not well thought out, and it becomes selfish. Like the reasons of why we choose to do those things often are to benefit ourselves and not others. So I think, you know, there are so many ways of, of engaging with that. That's why I think the two-eyed seeing approach is so important because it does, it allows you to use your experiences and, and Western traditions and Western ways of knowing while also emphasizing the importance of, of Indigenous ways of knowing and working collaboratively together and not prioritizing one way over the other. So I think you know, it's always, I will always say this, and, I, and they'll say it all, and I'll say it to my students all the time, it's about positionality, and it's really about knowing yourself in the context. Yeah, that's awesome, because we always have a trap of sort of empathy, you know, or mm -hmm. like, sort of, like we all want to help, yeah. we want to help, right, like, yeah. and I hear that, but sometimes you can help or you can think you're helping in a way that is actually yeah, damaging to communities. Well, of course, because we have illusions of, oh, we can empathize with them. So there's no differences, but actually not. So we have to think about positionality. So I'm, I'm, I'm really admire courage, sort of like very, you are very brave about like reflect yourself and confront yourself because it's not really easy to speak out about from the person who are in a privileged situation. So I really uh, appreciated that. All right, so last questions. Do you have any expectation for our students? I mean, in general, because uh, they're going to go to you in third and fourth year, which means that they're going to be more mature uh, when they meet you. And what's your expectations and what they really want to learn? Uh, That's a great question. Yes. I love that. I wish I could tell all students my expectations. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first things first is I will again emphasize by the time you get to me, know your positionality, get to know who you are, know what's important to you, your political backgrounds, your social, your ideas, you know, what's going on with you. Um, and also start rooting that in your work now. It's what's going to make your work exciting. It's going to make it what's unique and innovative. That's what's going to make you shine is if you understand who you are in the context of the work you're doing it makes you so much different than other people because it has an awareness it's self-awareness and self-awareness in our current i mean is always important but especially in our current political climate the second expectation is please do not 
underestimate the importance of writing and research. Too often I get students come to me uh, in third year and fourth year who are still not citing properly or who are still, you know, not putting in a, a bibliography or citation methods or who are doing very limited research. I cannot emphasize how important research is and properly citing. And the reason for that is because although we're doing stuff that is creative and it seems so obvious, your research is what's going to make your again your work different and stand out because you need to understand the industry you need to understand the political uh, value of your work in order to make arguments in order to convince people so whenever someone asks you to do research or write don't take that as like the least important thing that is the most important because in all honesty in the end of your degree almost all of you are going to have the same skills all of you are going to do the same projects. All of you are going to have, you know, know how to use social media. What's going to make you unique is your ability to connect that to social, cultural, political events and research and communicating clearly, because there are so many people on the planet who have this job, who have the jobs that you may be aspiring to. What makes them successful and what makes them pull out and make them unique is their ability to research and write. Do not underestimate the importance of writing and research. I Just because you're in a creative production department or class or program does not mean that writing is not important, that research is not important, especially with fact-based storytelling. You can't tell a fact-based stories without the fact. So please, 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 by the time you're with me, and in every other class, emphasize your writing and research because it's only it's one of the main times you're going to be able to practice that skill, and it's what's going to really make you shine in the job market. I promise. I'm not just saying that because I want to grade papers. I really don't want to grade papers. I'm just doing it because it's it is a skill that you need to know. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Because also. First year students really kind of suffer from all the cit cit citation rules, all that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was also kind of find that difficult to emphasize why that is very important, but you just actually clarify that. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, and, I mean, yeah. even in just like, just in the most simple ways, if you are writing a proposal for an organization, and you're like, I want to create the social media project for you, and you don't have a section on a research of what other organizations similarly are doing, I'm sorry, but your proposal is not strong. You need to know what others are doing in order for you to do better. And you can only do that through research. And if I was an organization and I did, and I saw a proposal that didn't have a review of what other organizations were doing, I'd be like, sorry, I can't take you because I know somebody else is going to give me that information. And I can't, I don't have that information. That's why I'm asking you to do it. So that's, it's incredibly important. I cannot emphasize it enough. I just like, I just want students to do research. We did research, so Shang and I, and we are constantly citing other people. Like, mm. like it's just, that's the reality of the world. You yeah. can't come up with a new idea without acknowledging how you got there. And you've gotten that from somebody okay. else, whether you think so or not. Great. Thank you so much, Steffi, for your time and all the energy and knowledge. So I really, really appreciate it. So this video is going to be shared on the our uh, students' course pages, price spaces, as well as YouTube channel. So I'll give them a space to ask your question. Yeah, so I hope student enjoyed it and I'm sure student enjoyed it. And if you guys have any questions and also use our social media channels or email Steffi about the research creation. Thank you so much, Debbie. Thank you, Sajang. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.